What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest episode of Games Up Podcast. It's just me this week because this weekend the entire Games Up crew went to see Green Day uh, in London, hence my voice being super croaky. Sorry about that. Uh, it also meant nearly 24 hours straight of travelling for Lawrence, so we figure asking him to be ready to record an episode in Glasgow when he gets back was a bit much. So the big episode we have planned with everyone back together will probably be next week. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, it's just me this week and my voice is super croaky. That's why. Thank you for putting up with it. Let's jump in as we do every week with the news and we start this week with another console announcement from Nintendo, although it's not quite on Switch level. This is the Mini SNES, a small replica version of the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, much like the Mini NES of a couple of years ago. This system comes preloaded with 20 games, one of which is Star Fox 2, a game that was previously unreleased anywhere. So this is actually the first time that Nintendo have published an NES game in years, decades. It's really impressive. However, there are a couple of kinks to this story if you're really excited for it, and I think it's worth bearing them in mind uh, before you go trying to place your pre-order. Firstly, pre-orders have already been and gone, I'm really sorry to tell you that. Uh, the pre-orders went up and were snapped up within minutes. They've had exactly the same problem that Nintendo have had for quite a while, where their supplies just can't match the demand of what there is for these consoles. However, it seems that that might actually be the intention here. Nintendo's gone on the record on a couple of sources to say that their intention, the mini SNES, is to grab headlines and footfall. The idea being that you're going to have to queue up for one of these things and the demand for it is going to rapidly outpace the supplies. The idea being that you're going to see far more headlines and far more demand and online talk about this than you'll ever see actual chance to buy one. The reason they do this is to keep their back catalogue in great demand so that people still care about Star Fox because they're thinking more about that game they didn't get to play than the bad one they did. It's a pretty well-known marketing tactic and they've done it in the past with consoles like the Wii and the Wii U with things like Blue Ocean selling. We've kind of done episodes that have touched on that in the past. If you want to look for it, go through the playlist. I'm sure you'll find one eventually. Uh, basically anywhere where we talk about Nintendo, the Switch is a really good example. Uh, the Switch reveal one's a really good example of that. But yeah, it seems like um, Nintendo are actually kind of intending for a f only a few people to get their hands on this, which is kind of a shame. They've also said that the uh, selling period for this has only been confirmed so far to be summer this year to the end of this year, so four five months. We know that the Mini NES went on for about a year in total before they stopped making it, uh, and they stopped making it earlier this year, and that led to the rumours of a Mini SNES, so maybe this is going to be a super short, super, super valuable, super in-demand product, uh, much like the Mini NES before it. Frankly, I think I'd rather see these games go onto Virtual Console, not just so that they get kept alive and so that we can still play them in years and years' time, but so that they're given to new kids, so that this generation of gamers can appreciate them on a level that they wouldn't. I don't think there are many 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds who'll be running out and queuing up for a SNES. That's aimed for my generation and the generations a little older than us. It's aimed for the people who grew up with these consoles and desperately want to relive it. I think I'd rather see these games get into the hands of new people so that they can appreciate how fantastic they were and maybe give those franchises and that revival a little bit more strength and also to preserve those games for the future because game preservation is something we have an issue with. But it seems like Nintendo is wanting to sell these at as much of a premium as possible and I guess that makes sense. So if you are still interested in getting one, keep your eyes out because pre-orders will go up all the time and they'll be gone within about five minutes or be willing to queue at your local GameStop or pay through the nose on eBay. That's unfortunately some of the uh, options that you're faced with. On to the next piece of news, and the next piece of news is all about Mass Effect Andromeda, and the bad news keeps rolling in. Rumours suggest that the Mass Effect Andromeda story DLC has been cancelled uh, in line with the focus on Mass Effect kind of being shelved at the minute uh, by order of EA. There's a lot of discussion about this online, about did they lie in this sense because they've advertised story DLC was coming, and honestly, I don't think it's fair to say that they're lying. 
Um, projects get shelved and cancelled all the time depending on how the market stands and how it moves and there may have been people who bought Mass Effect on the promise of the DLC but I think that's a very very small amount if it exists at all um, and what they're doing here is moving in line with where their company is going in the future I don't think that they're sort of trying to sneak it away from anyone obviously they're not going to publicly come out and say hey guys we cancelled our DLC that's not how they would message this kind of stuff. I don't think it's a case of them lying. I just think it's a case of them realigning themselves. Now, I think that's a shame. I think Mass Effect has more promise than just one game, and I think if they gave that same developer the time to focus on where they want to go and focus on the mistakes that they made, and actually, uh, there's a really, really interesting piece. I think it's Jason Schreier on Kotaku. I can't quite remember. I'll try and find it and source it in the comments. Um, but it goes into detail about why Mass Effect Andromeda had so many issues and where that trouble came from. It seems really to be mismanagement, but there's a lot of stuff going into it, and it's super worth a read. If you're interested at all in the way the gaming industry works and makes its projects, it's amazing. It's also really sad, because you kind of get to understand how business decisions impact IPs in a really long-term sense. And I get the feeling we probably won't be seeing Mass Effect for a little while to come. So that's Mass Effect Andromeda's DLC. It seems like it's been cancelled, if not very, very much put on the back burner with the rest of the Mass Effect franchise. And really, that makes sense. If they're not going to be making Mass Effect for a while yet, developing the lore and the franchise in a DLC doesn't really do anyone any favours. It's not going to make Andromeda much better. There's very little chance that they can improve on what's really a, a lacklustre game. It's not that the systems are broken, it's just they didn't have time to develop them properly. And so, really, all this would be doing is selling content to fans, and I think I'd rather that they don't sell anything more if they're not intending to do it properly and to do it with the respect it deserves. So, yes, no Mass Effect Andromeda, but at the same time, no more content for you to buy. Andromeda is Andromeda, and it will remain that way until Mass Effect either comes back or doesn't, and I think that's kind of a more honest way to go. The final piece of news this week is our topic of the week, and that topic of the week is, is I think Crash Bandicoot has just led a revival of the character platformer. Specifically, I think we're about to see Spyro the Dragon come back. I'll tell you why. It's being reported this evening uh, as I record this, which, by the way, is Sunday evening. It's literally hours before the show goes up. It is Sunday the 2nd of July, so this news might be outdated by the time the show goes live, depending on what people respond to. Sorry if that's the case. It's being reported tonight that Crash Bandicoot has sold some of the biggest numbers of a Sony-exclusive game by the way, still exclusive for the minute, though there seems to be more and more evidence that it's coming out on the Xbox One, if not other consoles that Crash Bandicoot has sold more units this year than any other exclusive Sony game, or at least significant numbers for a Sony exclusive game. This is fascinating for a number of reasons. The first of these reasons is that it's not an original game. You usually expect to see really, really strong sales numbers come from an original game or the next in their franchise. GTA V does gangbuster numbers because there's a huge amount of built-up hype from GTA 4 and the DLC. Same with Red Dead 2, same with stuff like the Batman Arkham games and Fallout 4. And then on the other side of the scale you have Minecraft, a totally new idea that does something revolutionary or does something that's really iterative or additive to the game industry and that and its hype train in a different way sells its numbers. Crash is neither of those things. It's a remake basically trading exclusively on nostalgia and graphics. It's telling the people that grew up with Crash Bandicoot that, hey, we made Crash Bandicoot look pretty again, are you willing to buy it? And to be honest, most of us are. We're kind of consumer suckers, but we grew up liking these games, and so in that sense it's trading on both its graphics and our nostalgia. On top of this, it's not developed by a particularly well-known studio. Back in the mid-2000s, Vicarious Visions were known for doing Spider-Man games, and I believe a few skateboarding games as well. But since then, they've mainly worked in tandem with other studios for their properties. They're doing a lot of work on Destiny 2, for example, but the studio you'll most see aligned with Destiny 2 is, of course, Bungie over Vicarious. So it's interesting that this game is not coming from Naughty Dog, one of the big premier studios of the games industry, but it has 
has built this massive following. The other reason that this is fascinating is because the type of game it is. It's a mascot platformer, a genre that was thought to be long dead. We haven't seen a strong mascot platformer basically since Crash Bandicoot or Spyro the Dragon. The closest argument you can make is Jack and Daxter on the PlayStation 2, but they didn't have the market share that Crash had, despite having the cult response and critical respect. Mascot platformers have not been along for a very, very long time, and they certainly haven't been prevalent in a very, very long time either. So it's fascinating that Crash Bandicoot, a game so dated purely by the nostalgia and type of game and when those types of game came out, has managed to sell so well in 2017. And you know what this is going to mean. The industry is going to smell a trend here, and they are going to capitalise on it as hard as they can. We've already seen this to some extent. Microsoft tried to relaunch Voodoo Vince, as well as giving a lot of marketing money, it seems, to Ukulele. Now the reason this was really interesting is because Ukulele was developed mainly by the people that made Banjo-Kazooie from back in the day at Rare. And it seemed like Microsoft gave them the, opportuni the opportunity to use some of the Banjo-Kazooie assets in their marketing. There was stuff like the honeycombs used uh, and things like that. It really seemed like Ukulele was being positioned to be like the mascot platformer of the new age, when actually Crash might have come and taken that crown back. The other interesting thing is there have been rumours about a Spyro remaster and a Jack and Dak remaster in the works for ages on top of this Crash Bandicoot remaster. And a little thing was found in Crash Bandicoot 3. In the original game, if you put in a version of the Konami code, it's not exactly the Konami code, it's like a bastardized version of it. If you put in a uh, version of the Konami code, you got to play the original Spyro demo. And if you put that code into Crash on the PlayStation 4, nothing happens at the minute, but the cursor disappears. And this is kind of interesting because it means that that code was put into the game. You remember that Crash was developed from the ground up. None of it is the code from the original games. It's been designed exactly the same, but with new code, meaning that whoever developed that bit of the game developed a way for you to put the code into it and develop the game to react to it in some way. The cursor disappears. It doesn't do anything more than that, but it does something. The other interesting thing is there's been a rumor, and it seems fairly well confirmed at this point, that there is some form of Crash DLC coming. The trophies for it were leaked. What they mean, as of yet, we're not sure. So it's time for me to put my tinfoil hat back on and give you another theory. I think this is what's going to happen over the course of the next six months. Crash Bandicoot The Insane Trilogy will be announced for all other platforms. I think it's coming out on the Switch, I think it's coming out on the Xbox One, and I even think we're going to see it on PC. But the DLC that we're getting will be the levels that never made it into the original games, the one that Naughty Dog planned, but they never coded for. I think we will see those levels in this game but those levels will be exclusive DLC for PlayStation. I think if the game is coming out on other platforms, it's too late for PlayStation to pony up a marketing deal to keep it on PS4. I think the game, if it's coming out on other platforms, is already coming out on them at this point. But I think they certainly could put the money forward that the DLC doesn't, and thus it stays in some form exclusive to Sony. So I think we get the announcement of the DLC being exclusive to PS4 in a couple of months' time, after the announcement that the game will be coming to the Xbox One, Switch, and PC uh, in time for, I'm thinking, December this year. The DLC will be exclusive to PS4, as I've said, but on the same day a patch will launch on all systems, and that patch will contain code for a revamped version of the Spyro demo. The Spyro demo will finish with an announcement of the Spyro trilogy coming out on all platforms next year. But at the PlayStation Experience Conference, they will announce that a demo of the original game, a much longer extended demo than the original Crash 3 had, will be available to all their players right here, right now. You can download it right now. So I think quick, quick summary of that roadmap. Crash Bandicoot comes out, sells a lot of money, but it goes out to the other platforms. The DLC, however, stays exclusive to Sony on the same day. Everyone gets a bit of code that allows you to play a new revamped remastered Spyro demo and that Spyro demo announces a Spyro collection much in the same way a Crash collection was announced. On the other hand, mascot platformers have shown 
that they don't necessarily work this generation. I mentioned ukulele earlier, and whilst ukulele was given money as though it was a mascot platformer, initial responses seem to be that the game hasn't sold what it was supposed to, and the critical response was fine, but not kind of overwhelming or, or particularly shiny. Now, we interviewed ukulele about a year ago, uh, and what we played and saw looked amazing, so we can't necessarily speak to the critical review or the selling figures, but what's being reported is that it didn't do as was hoped. So, I think another little thing you can pin onto this is that you're going to see a lot more mascot platformers and a lot more mascot remasters. I'd imagine you'll see a Banjo-Kazooie remaster. You might even see something as obscure as Blinks the Time Cat on Xbox. But I think a great deal of them will flop. And I think Crash and Spyro will be the ones that do the best if they do in fact happen. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago that Sony are in a truly unique position where they've built so many well-known franchises to an audience that's grown up now to buy games in an adult state that that nostalgia is one of the strongest things they have to trade on. Xbox doesn't really have that and the closest thing they have is Banjo-Kazooie. It might be the only one that's able to give Crash and Spyro a run for its money. If any of these mascot platformers are able to do this, I think it will be those three. And maybe something new, maybe Lucky's Tail will jump into that, but I think it's probably those classic three. And then I think we'll see a bunch of them from publishers trying to get in on the mascot platformer money, and it'll fizzle out fairly quickly. But then who knows? Maybe we won't. Maybe we don't see any of this. Maybe Crash stays on the PS4 and none of this happens. I guess we'll have to wait and see. So that, ladies and gentlemen, was Tinfoil Hat Week number two. I promise next week I'll stop making theories. But until then, if you liked the show, please feel free to come and have a look at us on our Facebook or Twitter pages. They're GamesUpCast on both, at GamesUpCast on Twitter. Uh, and subscribe to us on YouTube and iTunes, uh, where we put an episode out every Monday at 6.30pm earlier in the day on iTunes, so you can get it on your drive to work, hopefully. And we'd love for you to like it on YouTube as well, so that we can get out in front of a few more people. Other than that, that's my theory for the week. Thank you, and until next week, the game's up.